All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me here. This is my first Brucon. It is my first time in Belgium. And I think it is marvelous. So this is really, really cool. Sometimes my presentations are a little long, but we're going to rock through this. Let me see. We've got, oh, we only have 212 slides. Um, I think there's about eight words, though, so this will go kind of quick. So who am I? Um, besides being a guy who uh, sings a lot and eats a lot of meat and such, uh, mostly I'm known as being the security consultant who is a criminal consultant at night. Uh, I work in the physical security space, and m many of us who do anything physical side, it's, there's sort of a mystique about it. My fiance just basically says I'm professionally dangerous, since now we have a whole ops division and we do a lot of you know punchy, hitty, shooty things in the company. But yeah, I, I break into buildings. I do a lot of things relating to that, and I advise people about it. Now, most people should understand this already, like your data security is your physical security and vice versa. So when we read about data breaches, when we read about intrusions, the network side is starting to bleed over to the physical world. Like who read about the, the water plant where, you know, obviously ISC, SCADA, people were changing, you know, they were changing PLCs, they were changing flow rates. So they said, oh wow, the, something that was logical became kinetic. And yes, like that is, that is a physical impact of an attack, but the just the fact that you know your systems are outdated and like nobody ever sees like this is at a power plant like nobody ever sees outdated systems right this is not what i mean when i talk about physical impacts i'm talking about just actual physical breaches because i came from an infosec background and my keyboard foo is like long since expired but i'm still good enough that if my team is contracted on a network job like one of us can get into the wiring closet and I can, th I'm a dummy, but I can throw console cables into anything I see and just try to drop to single user mode and just, again, physical access is the ball game. So we try to tell people, you're, everything you do right, like you can segment it out, you can follow all the rules and have your policies and let's harden that down, but the wrong decision at the hardware store when you're setting up your office can be the ball game. Not to mention, a lot of times executives really start to, they don't understand, like, oh, what's a SQL injection and why is this bad? That user credentials, what? Salted hash? I don't, I don't salt my hash in the morning. Like, execs don't get that. But again, like, we deal with power companies and utility companies and hospitals. And if I can walk, I've just taken photos. I'm like, what's this thing? What if I push buttons on it? Should I do that? And they're like, no, don't do that. I'm like, okay, well, I, I just walked in here. This is bad. Or it's like theft. There's a, like a big drug problem in America, and this is just a ton of brass and copper on a shelf of a very small water company or a bunch of expensive meters at a water company. These are all things where I'm showing companies like, hey, physical security, you should probably pay attention to that too. And like, again, we, we are way too afraid of terrorism in our country, but I freak people out when I showed this photo once. I was like, oh, this is chlorine gas. Like, I'm just standing next to it. I shouldn't be here. No one's stopping me. So that's really, that's like kind of the big stuff that I get to do. I like to point things out like, hey, your physical security has a problem. But what people often don't realize is when I go in and I am, I am in a place I shouldn't be, and they say, well, what, how'd you get through the door? Well, I'm known as a lock picker. And people who, has anybody ever like seen me running a lockpick village or something at a con? Like my whole crew of people are awesome and it's usually not me anymore. Like it's all the people in Tool and all my friends at Core, like all those volunteers are just teaching everyone to lockpick and that's great. But as easy as lockpicking is, and if you've never taken a lock apart, you might not know how a lock works, but as, as easy as a lock is to understand and as easy as a lock is to exploit, Ask me later if you really want to have questions about what's going on here in this picture. This, this is lock picking, and anybody who's done lock picking will tell you it's, it's a pretty simple process of, like any hacking, you stress the system and you make it behave in a way you weren't expecting. So lock picking is simple to, to grasp, and I could teach anyone in this room to do it, but it shocks people when I say, on a job, I am never lock picking, like virtually never anymore. And if, if I just make a full picture for the client, like. After we're done, I'll pick a few doors and we'll document it and like whatever, we'll put it in the report. But we don't care because we don't need to pick locks to get in and criminals basically never pick locks to get in. So forget lock picking for this whole talk. This is not gonna be deviant telling you anything about lock picking, that's a topic for another time. Because it's way, way stupid easier to get into doors a lot of simpler ways and I wanna tell you about those ways because that's what I actually use in the field. 
and they're stupid easy to fix. So everything you see is going to be like, oh shit, and then it's going to be, yeah, you fix it like this. So ready to rock through some, some good tips? All right. Dude, the fucking hinges on a door. Like, it shocks people when you show them, like, it's not hard to bang pins out of hinges. You can knock the hinge pins out of most doors and just walk that door away from the frame. So like, you can do it with a nail. They make special little tools that you can use to not bang your fingers. But in the end, like, you could have a super locked up door. Like, you could see all these locks on this door. But what you can't see are hinges because the hinges are on the other side of that door. So I don't care how many locks are down this one side. I can pop the hinge pins and just swing it out away from the frame, and I'm in. Stupid easy to fix. There's something called a security hinge. Look on the left up there. That hinge has a hole in one side and a peg. If that door swings shut, that peg is sticking into the door frame through the, through the hole. I can pop those pins, but I can't pull the door out of the door frame. Way easy. What's on the right side? Those are called jam pins. What are jam pins? If you want a security hinge and you don't have one, you go ahead to your conventional hinge. You take these two screws out. You replace them with jam pins. You take these two screws out. You replace them with fuck all. You just made a security hinge, and you didn't even have to rehang your door. The jam pins are like JP12 is the product number from major manufacturing. They make locksmith gear. They're like $11, I think. Stupid easy to fix. Way simple. Every critical door you have, why not put some jam pins in it? How about the latch? What is, what is the latch? What do I mean? Well, when you close a door and it goes click, that little plunger that's sticking into the frame is called the latch. And the latch is the first thing we usually go for. I'm not usually popping hinge pins out on most jobs, I'll be honest. Like, I've done it, but the latch, whoo boy, let's talk about this. So this picture is actually uh, a, a gear dump from one of my friends named Keith. This is years ago. And uh, I was meeting, and I was like, Keith, wow, you know, you actually were a trading locksmith. I'm just some jackass on the internet, but like, you were in the field every day for years in Florida. I would love to have seen your like daily carry kit. And he's like, oh yeah, I still have it. It's a little zipped up, beat up pouch. And he dumps it on the table. And I was like, huh, well, all right, that's kind of anticlimactic. I, I, I guess you're servicing a lot of stuff in the field. You're fixing things and installing things. I, I meant your like entry kit. He's like, what are you talking about? This is my entry kit. These are my top three entry tools right here. And I'm like, what are you, what? And this is when I was not, I was just a lock picker. I didn't realize that locksmiths, criminals, everyone are, are just popping the latch with little thin tools, especially the one in the middle. I was like, what the hell? He's like, I don't know, I found it at a yard sale. It's like, I call it a Carolina roller because that's what's stamped on it. I found the Carolina roller company. They're like a textile supply business. And I was like, hey, your website's terrible, but I think I figured out what this one thing is. What is, she's like, oh, it's a traveler hook. We, you know, you use it with a loom. I was like, cool, can I order 100 of them? And the lady on the phone, she's like, most people order like two? I was like, yeah, but you don't speak Pashto or Urdu and your business is dying in America, so why don't you just sell me these things while you're still around? So I order these from this textile supplier and it's like everyone's favorite tool now that we sell to friends and we use like, so here we have a lock door. Here's a lock door. We're just gonna travel our hook this. This is at some like, water company, I'm pretty sure. What's happening there, right? Well, let's just double check. This door is completely closed. It is completely locked. But if I reach in with this traveler hook, boom. Well, I'm reaching in the door jam. And if you've ever seen on like old spy shows, like credit carding a door, it's the same principle. The latch, if you can grab it or hook it or push it or do something and retract that latch, the latch is spring loaded, right? Like when you close a door, the latch usually springs and then clicks into place. You can do this with Slim Jim tools. If you've ever seen like a Slim Jim or a Mini Jim as a chopped down version, we use those too. The idea of just reaching in and getting on that latch, getting that latch moving, and don't think that, by the way, protecting a latch with like a big plate prevents this, because that doesn't always happen. So here's a big plated up door. Lol, oops. <laughs> yeah. Getting to that latch, I don't know if we can drop the lights uh, up here. You guys, it's a I, all my slides are all video and photos, so the better you can see them, the better it's going to be. So, yeah, what's, what's going on? That's not supposed to happen, by the way. This is, oh, thank you. So let's talk a little bit more detail about latches, specifically dead latches. It's a term you may have heard. So back in the day, 
many doors, and this, this is a very common latch set that you see in North America. You don't, there's, they're all around the world, different latch styles, but we can talk about this. This highlighted part, this is the latch. This is what holds the door shut when you close it. And many people may remember a time when that's the only thing a door had. Like, this is what a door latch used to look like. And then eventually, like, extra little buttons or levers or ev extra little hardware started showing up around your door latches. That extra piece is the dead latch engaging mechanism. That little plunger is, many people don't realize this, because when you see it, the door is open. When you close the door, that little plunger is supposed to be held back or pressed in by the strike plate or by the door frame, or by any number, depending on the door installation. That makes the latch dead. You can't reach in and spring it, or hook it, or push it, or any of that bullshit if the dead latch is working correctly. The problem is, many times they're not working correctly. So here is an electronic card access door. Nice lock. We're going to attack it with a piece of garbage. Boom! That door, and server room, that door's open. Um, now, that was literally, like, literally, it was a piece of garbage. It was a clamshell packaging from some, like, office stapler that was, like, in a trash can. And I just took out my knife and kind of carved it into a vague rectangle, and we opened half the doors in this company this way. Now, you can see the problem, by the way, what's, what's causing this. Look at the size of that strike plate hole. It's fucking massive. So, electronic strike plates are a big problem in this world. The reason being, all different part numbers, all different model numbers. You, you guys have seen these like around your facilities, right? You badge in, you hear the click and the solenoid pops. Integrators and installers, many times, they're like, oh, we've got a job to do down on uh, 17th Street today. Yeah, we're like, yeah, yeah, that new Widgeco company, they need their doors done. How many doors, 50? Johnny, do you have more of those uh, XQ19s? They're the ones with the really big hole, right? They always work, no matter what door we're hanging that day. So installers will often use like the biggest one because it always works, like no matter which plunger or latch you have, it's always gonna fit. That's a problem because the hole is so big, it's not holding back the plunger. Here's the co-owner of our company, Bobak, looking totally ninja bad. Like, boop, that's a locked door. And he's just through. But look at it from the other angle here. You'll see there is a security plunger. It's a dead latch. It's not doing anything. You got it. This is a problem all the time. We see this everywhere. Uh, this is an, a video you're going to see. This is, again, like a field station for another water utility. So I'm reaching in. And the guy, it was funny. These fellas I was walking around with. Didn't take you long at all. Yeah, yeah they're, they're like doing morning rounds, and I was walking around with them just writing up some notes. And like one guy's like, well, I'm going to go in here for a while if you want to work on the door. And you he heard him. He's like, wow, that didn't take you long at all. I'm like, yeah, dude, like your door is not closing correctly. And this was like the well controls for the west side of this whole facility. So I love showing this to people. It's a real shocker, but it's so also stupid easy to fix. Know, Sergeant lock, but again, here we go. It's bad door fitment. That was a different style of dead latch plunger, but it wasn't working correctly at all. It wasn't, the latch wasn't even extending all the way. And like, I don't belong in here. You don't want me in here at all. I don't want to be in here. I'm going to hurt myself or kill myself or something. But a like $5 hook got me through what was a, arguably a really nice door, all because the latch wasn't engaging correctly. And it's stupid easy to fix that. Put the right latch plate on. The inside handle. So that's the, you know, the latches in the door jam. What about just inside where like, you know, the handle is on the inside of the door? Well, let's look at, you know, let's look at a door like this. This door is locked. Oops. Like it's not hard to reach through a door. Most doors that have weather stripping, if you kind of look at them just right, you can see through the crack, like any kind of crack in a door, reaching through with hook tools, slapper tools. There, there are a variety of interior handles that will try to be fancy. They'll try to have like galvanic skin response, like capacitive touch handles. You can, you know, we, the freaking copper dude, like you hit them with copper wire, you're literally holding the other end of the copper. It's gonna get a skin response and it's just gonna unlock the same way. Uh, that was the door, by the way, that this door right here is where they were storing like all the chem tanks. And I could have like just taken them off the wall, changed the feeds. And people will think that, you know, they look at the door like, well, it looks pretty, pretty solid. I don't see any light leaking through. Again, weather stripping is not a security product. 
Weather stripping is not preventing this attack, that you need a better plate over the door if you're trying to actually stop this. So this works on crash bars, it works on exit paddles, it works on a lot of different, any sort of push to exit you know, bar on a door, I'm usually gonna try to reach through and just slap it from the outside. Now in that, in that video, by the way, which I really do love it, because it's, again, it's just bent rod. Does anyone spot, this is like two in the morning, right? Nobody's in this office. What could they have done that would have frustrated this process? Shout it out, I can hear you. Turn off the lights? Well, I mean, you know, I, I can see. Yeah, oh, I see a hand. Yes, yeah, so, so people are saying, use the deadbolt, right? Like, the, clearly the deadbolt wasn't even locked in this office. They were relying on their badge system. Well, let's talk about deadbolts. Most of the time, because of fire code and other reasons where I come from, deadbolts all have a big old thumb turn on the inside. So instead of reaching through with a slap tool, this thing exists. You know what that is? That's a thumb turn flipper. You reach it through, you need to go murp, murp. And then you slap the handle and then there you go. So yeah, this is, these tools are out there, man. Like feds have them, we have them, some criminals have them. Be aware of this kind of stuff. Oh boy, key boxes. This is just lulzy as sin. So I don't know how prevalent this is. I don't see these much in Europe. In America, man, key boxes are everywhere. For whatever purpose, you've got a contractor who has to come in and out of this one door and he or she needs access, but you don't want to give them a badge. So somebody winds up sticking a key for a door. It sounds like I'm making this up if you've never seen it. Like, Nickerson, how many times, Chris, like, freaking key boxes, man. Like, this is a, this is like an, I think a Schlage Primus on this door. None of us are effing with that. But there's this little key box up top with a tubular lock, which people are like, oh, tubular lock, it's so secure. No, like, Tubular lock, very popular in industrial control settings. There are tubular picks that have been out there for a while. They work really well. This is a clear see-through lock. We show people in uh, heavy industry this, like, because they love tubular locks. They think they're the hottest new thing. And I'm like, dude, this is like a product from the 80s. So popping these key boxes, literally it is the key for the door and it's on the door. And you like, oh, that's, I would never happen here. That's so dumb. Walk around and, and look for them you start spotting them. There's a lot of instances where depending on where you live, emergency responders need to get into a facility and many times they have key boxes that you might not even realize are outside your building. Just be aware of that. The most common times that I see key boxes though are complete reeky dink key boxes. Um, again, rural installations, water towers, radio towers, you have all kind of cellular arrays on top of like, in, like infrastructure, at least where we come from. And you'll have like Sprint and AT&T and somebody else, they'll all have their field technicians, will have a terrible little key box on a fence somewhere, and every one of them contains like the key for the thing that you need to get into. And these are all super bypassable or decodable. Uh, almost all of these little key keeper boxes, I can show you how to pop them open in seconds and get the code out, get the key out. They are not something that you should be relying on if you can avoid it. Um, the, the problem is it's, it's hard to get around this. If you need five different companies to have access to this weird resource in the forest, uh, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to manage that problem, but you've got to start thinking about it because leaving the key for the thing attached to the thing, protected by useless, that's bad. The gap, so the big like gap that runs down the whole door, like where we were slipping stuff through to slap the handles and stuff, you can do a lot with that whole edge gap. Sometimes you can slip something through that's not even like a corporeal object. So here's a door. This door is locked. And then... <laughs> this door is unlocked. There's our friend Dr. Tran coming through. Let's look at a clear see-through door and you can get a little bit of a better picture. A lot of you know this trick, I bet. If you haven't, if you've never seen it, you'll understand pretty quickly. This is a development lab uh, back in Philly where we do a lot of our like product creation. So this lab is locked, but our friend Ross, who just learned this like a second ago, and he's like, hey, look what I learned, and Bobak is helping him get the, this thing in the right place. He is sticking a very special hacking tool up against the door, and you can see through the door, you might have seen a little cloud of air. Well, he's using this very sophisticated product. Uh, you just have to hold it like a hacker. You have to hold it like this, and you're now a physical pen tester. You flip a can of duster upside down, you make that cold air blast, what you're triggering are infrared sensors. 
many times, these are called request to exit sensors. If you're leaving a facility and the door automatically unlocks, you're tripping either a motion sensor that is range radar, microwave radar, which is very rare, or usually you're tripping an infrared sensor, a passive infrared sensor. And all it needs to see is temperature differential. And it's like, oh, this is a person who's clearly already inside the door. They must be authorized and they need me to open. And the door like effing unlocks. So there's a lot of lulzy videos out there about this. You and Dave like filmed this one at uh, DerbyCon. Uh, so who was, who was here last year? I understand Dave here was here last year right at BrewCon. So this is Dave Kennedy, uh, big e-cig guy. I think he like sub-ohms his coils, so he, he blows really big smoke, which led to this being awesome. Same door that we use the one gas cloud on. So <laughs> he's just, he's like, all right, I can get a bigger one. I can get a bigger one. Let's try it. Let's try it. And click red light. There we go. Now unlocked. <laughs> so like, I love that. That's awesome. Big hand for Dave. What's that? Oh yeah, when people are like, why is there smoke pouring through the door? Do we have to leave? Yeah. Literally, it's a magic trick. You, you appear and it's like, smoke bomb! Um, I was walking home from a bar with my fiance one night and I just I apparently walked out of the bar with one of my whiskeys and I was like, hey, hey, check this out. I think we could, so she whipped, thank goodness she was smart enough to whip her phone out when I was like, hey, I wanna do something funny. She's learned, she's like, oh, this could be interesting. And this kind of hit YouTube a little while ago, if you didn't see it. This was a bank in the town where I used to live in Montana. So it's locked. It's like 2 in the morning. But there is a rec sensor up there, there right? There is a rec sensor up there. So take a mouthful of whiskey. Oops. Now, can you solve this? Yeah. You could either not use passive infrared, you can use RCR, you can use range radar, which is microwave based, or you can just use like a push to exit button. There's a lot of smarter installs. Have you ever had a facility where you had to push a button to leave? Or even badge in, badge out? These are all valid depending on what level of interaction your users are gonna be agreeable to. But be aware that every facility like who just says, oh, we need an exit sensor, it's going to be a supplier shipping you a bunch of Honeywell PIRs and they're all going to be tripped out super easily because nobody wants to have the sensor that like doesn't alert. When you walk up to the door and you got boxes, nobody wants to like bang into the door and fall over. They want that sensor to always pick up any little movement so it's super easy to fake them out. You can go through the bottom gap and do that too, by the way. Um, you, you used to tell the story of the, did you actually do the love doll once or, yeah. Because some, some people use like a, a balloon, but like they used other inflatable things under doors. But you can do a lot under those doors to like blow something up or like, I've, one time I just dumped isopropyl alcohol, it was a hospital. Um, they were not open yet, it was a new install that they were doing, but it's a hospital. So I found alcohol and it's like vinyl floor. So I just made a puddle of it on the ground and lit it. Uh, and the flame went under the door. It's a cool burning flame, it's fine, it's fine. But it was hot enough to, to trip the sensor and that was great. But other things you can do with a gap under the door are mechanical in nature. And it has to do with lever style door handles. Now many places, and this is true in Europe as well as in the US, when's the last time you've seen like a door knob in a commercial setting? You, you don't see that anymore. And I know at least where we come from in the States, that is by law. Uh, people with disabilities, people who have limited grip or, you know, they can't use their hands. It's for accessibility, you have these knobs, not, knobs are not the thing. You have these lever style door handle sets. Well, under door attacks that reach for the inside handle are great if you have a lever style handle. It's wonderful. So here we see a nice big plated door and there's a card reader and it's a pretty serious lock. But I'm just down there at the bottom gap and I'm doing something and then Yoink. Well, let's, let's look at that from the other side and see what actually you know, happened. It's not sophisticated. This is called an underdoor you know, reaching attack. It's literally a rod and a piece of string or wire. And you are delivering the rope or the string right where you need it. You can feel and hear where you are. Like I can tell blind where I am on the door. I can hit it, I can yank it, and bam. There, you cannot get more basic than that. 
And they they sell like the Kedex K22 is the one that the government likes. Like we never use them. We always go to Home Depot or Lowe's and just buy a piece of rod and string and make one on site because it's easier than trying to fly with this big thing. But it's amazing how simple that is to do. Now, are there solutions to this? Yeah, there's a number of them. One is the most advanced is to use what's called a dynamic door bottom. And this little animation gives you a rough idea of, of what that means. A plunger sticks out of the side of the door here. There's a mechanism, actually in this case, mortised into the door. And when the door closes, the bottom pushes down. Now this is not a security product, this is just like an environmental light and heating and cooling leakage product. But that principle, that sort of plunger bottom, that exists. Uh, there's a company called Pemco, they're a division of Asa Abloy. They make a security door bottom, which does the same thing. It's a big plunger that pushes a plate and there's a contoured floor plate and it like locks in place when the door open, when the door is shut. That's great, you're, you're not getting that up, you're not getting under there. Um, you can put it, you know, it's, it's nice. I think it's the, what is it, is the Pemco 530 if you're curious. Nice product, any locksmith, you can install it on the door, in the door. It's expensive compared to other solutions I've seen. This is awesome. This like blocking shroud that just went on the inside of the door. And I found, I figured out what I was on this one door. I'm like, what in the ass? I'm like ripping and pushing and pulling and I can't see what's happening. And eventually we stuck a snake cam under the door and they were like, oh dude, you're fucked. You're not getting through that. I'm like, what? And I look at the screen. I'm like, what is that friggin' thing? I thought it was a security product. It's not. It's used in service areas to like prevent maid carts from getting hung up on doors, but this one company put them on all their critical doors, and I was like, that's brilliant, and it cost you like no money, awesome, that made my day hell. Like, like screw you, but good on you. Uh, there, how many people have been in hotels where your room, the inside handle, is now mounted like this, or even like this? Hotels know about this shit. They understand, people use this in hotels a lot. That's an easy mitigation. Renderman, a friend of ours, was in a hotel, and he sent me these pictures. He was like, dude, check this out. My hotel has this weird clip thing, and I think it's probably to prevent underdoor attacks. I was like, you bet your ass that's to prevent underdoor attacks. That's amazing. That's really cool. And then I saw it at a hotel where I was staying in California. And I was like, well, I got to find out, like, what the hell? Now I've seen it twice. Like, what is this security product? So I was friendly with the, the security guy at the desk. I'd been talking about various things. I'm like, dude, so... Uh, under door attacks, you got like, oh yeah, yeah, we had a big problem, like hobos were making these tools and breaking it. They weren't stealing, it was very California. They weren't stealing things, they were just like sleeping for the night, like free in hotels, <laughs> in like the Soma district and shit. But uh, they're like, yeah, we had a big problem with like vagrants coming in, so we had to do that. I'm like, where did you buy this security clip thing? He's like, that's for like closets and bedrooms, like the, 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 you get it at a Home Depot. It's like the little track slider thing that guides. He's like, yeah, we just bought a bunch of them for four bucks and we put them on all the doors, it works great. I'm like, that's fucking brilliant, that's awesome. Like, I love low tech solutions, man. So yeah, the under door thing is a huge risk. It, I see a lot of doors vulnerable, but the solutions are not, uh, not that hard to do for various budgets, right? One other really low-tech thing that's just kind of wild when you think about it, door jacking, door frame jacking or spreading. It is possible, and this is more common in Europe as an attack than, than in the States. Criminals will sometimes rush up to a door with a big hydraulic jack and just click, 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 and just literally spread the door frame apart right at the middle of the door where the deadbolt and plunger latch are. I did this without destroying it. Usually a criminal just destroy a door. I did this when I lived back in West Philly, this old historic home. The neighbor had the same home. It was like 1902. The neighbor's door, like his door latch was so old, like it fell apart, like the doorknob snapped off and it was closed. It was his freaking basement door. And he's like, I got to get to my base. I got like my, my laundry is there. I think my cat's down there. What can you do? And I'm, I'm like reaching and prying and I'm like, I can't get anything. And he was going to take an ax to the door. He's like, I, I Got to get this door open. I don't know what to do, man. I'm like, don't destroy this gorgeous old wood with this veneer. And like, I love old things. I'm like, hang on. So I go out to my truck and I chop up some two by four and I bring the scissor jack. And like, if you've ever jacked a car up, you know, like it's not easy, but you can do it with like one hand. Like, oh, I'm jacking a car. We had to put like a cheater bar on the end of this. And we're just like, Rrr! and the whole house was like, Rrr! and like cracking a little bit. But we got all of a sudden, like just enough turns on the jack. And I looked and I was like, 
and the door just kind of swung open. And then it was like a tourniquet. We had to like ease it down and you like let the whole house settle back into shape and it was fine. It didn't damage the door. This is totally a thing that in an extreme case, it's almost destructive attack, someone could do. They do make deadbolts that will interlock with the door frame. This is one style of that. This is called a hammerhead deadbolt where the door frame actually will have a little cup with uh, sockets in it and you can see the deadbolt has little balls that shoot out the sides. There are hook style deadbolt latches. There's a lot of solutions where the deadbolt is not just a bar sticking out, where it's actually locking in the door frame. So keep that in mind. If you think a door frame jacking or spreading attack is a problem that you might face, there's hardware out there that'll prevent it. What about padlocks? A little quick diversion because, you know, padlocks are a thing we use. Well, give you some terminology first, all the different parts of a padlock, and then I'm gonna show you how pretty much all of them get exploited. So, padlocks essentially are the following. Pa most padlocks are a shackle of some kind, that is the removable bent piece of metal, usually hooking to a chain or a door or what have you, and that shackle rests in the body. Everything else is the parts inside that allow this to open and close easily. So the keyway is where you stick your key. The keyway is part of the plug. The plug is the round part that turns when you operate a lock. The keyway and the plug are allowing you to interact with a series usually of little pins or what are called the pin stacks are a series of pins. When the key goes in, the pins align, the plug can turn. That tail side of the plug is usually interacting with some sort of release latch or cam latch that hits the actual latching uh, dogs that are grabbed. That's what's holding the shackle together. In a nutshell, that's what's happening in almost every padlock you use. All right, let's take a dump on all of that really quickly now. So right at the top, the latches. Most cheap padlocks, the latches that hold the shackle shut are spring-loaded. Most cheap padlocks, if they're open, like you can just snap them closed with, a key, with the key not involved. Well, spring-loaded latches are a problem. There are products called padlock shims. This is not news to a lot of people in this room, I'm sure. How many people have seen padlock shimming before? That's a lot of hands. Good, about half the room. So here's an example of padlock shimming, right? This is a locked lock. Put a little thin piece of metal right against the shackle where it is being latched and held in place. Jam it down, inside the shackle has now been released from the latch, click, that's open. Locksmiths use these all the time. They use them on combo locks, key base locks, big or small, unless you've seen the inner workings of the lock, you really don't know if it's vulnerable or not to shimming. There are locks that aren't vulnerable, but it's, you know, it's not a size thing, it's not a beefiness thing. This is a pretty big, beefy, serious padlock, but you'll see one shim goes in, and click spring, bang. That is a spring-loaded little latch catch. That is not you know, a hard thing to defeat. Proper padlock shims you can buy in locksmith supply catalogs. You can make your own. Many people have seen me talking about making shims out of beer cans and, and stuff like that. It's totally easy. Some locks have you know, latches on both sides. You just need two shims. It's not that difficult. It's not really stopping someone from doing this. So what is the solution? If these little padlock shims, which cost like a buck or zero dollars, if like, you know, you have a beer can laying around that costs you nothing, like what is the solution? Well, the solution is don't have spring-loaded latches. Little spring-loaded latches don't know what's pushing on them. They just say, oh, something's pushing on me. That must be the shackle coming down. I better spring out of the way. So like a latch is a dumb object. It has no authentication or decision tree. It just springs out of the way if you put pressure on it. So instead of this, you can have mechanisms in really good padlocks that are called double ball mechanisms, or sometimes they're just called unshimmable mechanisms. Here's an example. So look at the tail side of that plug. Up at the tail side, you actually have this sort of cammed control cylinder right here. And these are not spring-loaded latches. These are solid steel ball bearings. They will not fall inward unless that control cylinder has positively turned, by, usually by action of the key. Cutaway version of an old Sergeant and Greenleaf railroad lock. This is the old S&G environmental. Still in use today by most railroads. Uh, double ball mechanism, proper padlock. You're not shimming that open. Beautiful design. Let's talk about a few other things, though, because that's just, that's just the latches. Let's talk about some more. Skeleton keys. 
oh, good Lord, what are we, t like, in the 16th century in medieval Europe, like skeleton keys? No, skeleton keys still exist. They exist for a very, very super basic BS type of lock called a warded lock. Thankfully, I have almost never seen a warded lock in use anymore in Europe as, like, a, a padlock. We got them all over the U.S. because we just suck a lot in some ways. You can always tell a warded lock, especially by the key, if the key has this really jagged square shape to it. I, has anyone in Europe ever seen a, a key that looks like that in use in Europe? I, you saw it once or twice? Okay. So uh, warded locks are out there, man. What's going on? Well, well, warded locks are almost an entirely inverted security model with a lock and a key. And this is why skeleton keying is possible. Inside a warded lock is not an intricate series of pins and you know, stacks. It's like a lever. The key goes in, and now it's a little hard to see here. These protrusions in the keyway, these are the wards. The wards are the protrusions of metal. Do you understand the key is sliding next to them? That's, that's what's happening in this photo. Does that make sense? The key can slide in next to them, but only if the key has complementary cuts can the key actually turn. So the key has to have the opposite cuts of the warding to eventually spring open. But it's not really the lock querying the key. Like, are you the right key to turn in me? The key is really querying the lock. The key is like, hey, I'd love to turn. Is anything in my way? So if you have the wrong key, like, of course, the wrong key will fit in the keyway, but it won't turn. But it's part of the key that's causing the interruption. Chop all that shit off. That's what a skeleton key is. It is you trim away all the extra flesh and you are left with the bare bones, the skeleton. A skeleton key will reach in and just hit the lever and ignore all the wards. And literally, people have been doing this for centuries to the point that now these are called warded picks. They're really just skeleton keys. The idea is you reach into that lock, find the lever with whatever pick tool or key tool you can find, and spring the lock open. It is like the complete nadir of security as far as padlocks are concerned. Please be aware of that. But most, most locks you see do not use the, the warded lever system. Most locks are pins. So let's talk about the pins. Not picking them, not bumping them even, but let's talk about overlifting, because this is like what's old is new again. Comb picks. Comb picks are a thing that I am shocked still work. And for a long time, they didn't. Like, comb picking was known to be a problem, and all the manufacturers who made any, and door locks too, like they used to be vulnerable and then they weren't. What, what is a comb pick? What is happening? What is overlifting? What do I mean? Overlifting should not be possible in a pin-based lock, first of all. So if you have these pin stacks where you have the red key pins and the blue driver pins and springs, if you try to push one of those pins, like the, the pin stack as high as it'll go, almost you're, you're crushing the spring at this point, you can't get the pin stack like up out of the plug. And even that's a really long pin stack, right? Even a tiny pin stack, like I can't get this tiny pin stack all the way out. There's just not enough room. But if the lock is not designed correctly, and believe me, I don't know why, well, I do know why. It's because it's easier to machine locks quickly sometimes. You'll get locks like this, where there's way too much room up in the housing above the plug. What is a comb pick? What is overlifting? Well, you go in with this long tool, it looks like a little comb, and you just shove all the pins completely out of the plug, and the plug just spins around, and there's nothing in the lock at that point. Like, this is an actual thing that affects That's actual nice. locks on store shelves actually right, actually now. This is not an old antique. This is a off the rack. Comb goes in, pins go up, bloop. Master 140 series, Master 142, 142D, like these are on, the, there's Abbas brand locks on the shelf right now, they're low end, that are comb pickable. That is insane. Moving on. The release cam, like on the tail side, let's say you can't comb pick it, you can't like get the plug turning, well, you can sometimes reach right into the back of the lock and just hit the release mechanism. A very popular combination lock, where we come from, multi-wheel combination lock by Master, has this super well-known vulnerability where you stick a thin blade into the lock, squeeze it, push it, rock it down, and the lock just flies open. What's actually happening in this lock? Well, when you operate the lock, this long piece of, you know, this long metal plate, I call it the tongue, the tongue has to rock upward to release the latches. Well, if you want that tongue to rock upward, go in with a long, skinny tool. You can actually go in, the way that these locks are designed, the, the wheels have a little gap on the left side of each wheel. And 
if you slip a tool into the left of any of the wheels, but the third wheel gets you closest to the middle, so that's what I recommend. Get in between those wheels, get right underneath the plate, and you can see in this cutaway, rock, boing. Like, that is not an antique, this is not a trick lock, this is off the shelf, like new product that somebody made as a cutaway. And I think we even have uh, footage of one that's, yeah, let's see, we got this here. We have, an, I think we have an original, yeah, this is like a brand new original one. And you can just reach in, and I think we spring this one open too. These are, every time that someone's like, oh, have you heard the master ones? Yeah, they fixed it. And I'm like, really, they fixed it? And I go buy one. I'm like, they didn't fit, they made it tighter, so it's like harder to get in there. But they haven't retooled this mechanism. This is still a vulnerability on the shelf right now. And it's one of the most popular locks of the country where we come from. I don't know what vulnerabilities are lurking in some of the most popular locks here. But reaching through the lock is absolutely a thing. There's a bypass tool for a brand of lock called American Lock, where we are. This is not a lock pick. Ooh, 10 minutes, all right, we'll make it. We're good, we're only on slide, uh, yeah, 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 169, we, we got this, I'm talking. Are you still following, are you tracking, are you liking this, this is good? Okay. There is a bypass tool that literally reaches right through the lock and flicks that control cylinder, because what you're seeing is the tail side of the keyway deep in the lock. And I love this story because when American heard about this, they released this little stamped piece of metal, this disc, and they said, well, eject the core, like, because the locks are disassemblable. Like, eject the core, put the disc on, and put it back together, and it covers it up. And it was like they released a patch. They're like, here, this is a hot fix. Download this, it's Tuesday, and you know, cover that hole. So the person who made the bypass tool, a guy named Ken, he also designed this. It's called a, a security wafer breaker. So that little security wafer, if you stick this tool and you hit it and you turn it, you punch it, you pull, it blows a hole like exactly where you need it in the security wafer and the attack still works, so that's pretty fun. Now, like these are all stupid, simple attacks and all of them though, a good quality lock will not be vulnerable to any of these. A proper padlock, a decent, like, like a decent mid-range even lock should not be vulnerable to any of this kind of stuff. But think critically about things. Look around at your doors, look around at your locks, and you'll start spotting this. So like, let's talk about this door right here. This door has got a variety of interesting problems. Who can just shout it out, name some shit you're seeing. Like, what's going on here? Yeah, the gap, the weather stripping, you could reach through. What kind of system do you see inside the door that you might be able to trigger or attack? There's what, yeah, so the, mag the lock is magnetic. There is a motion sensor I heard somebody say on the ceiling, or I don't know if you were thinking you could just slap the, the handle, it's just a regular release handle. But the magnetic lock is an interesting one too. So magnetic lock systems are one of the most popular systems in environments where you have electromechanical tie-ins, where badge systems, access control systems. You're either talking solenoid plates or electronic locks. So electronic locks like this, many of them fail open if there's no power. A lot of times that's by code. If there's an emergency in the building, the power goes out like you need to egress. So let's think about this. This was in the basement of a hospital that had multiple wings connected by like a tunnel. Now it looks like I'm on the secure, like the, the inside, the sterile side of the door, but actually this door had a badge reader on both sides. And you, to, to, trans, you know, to, go, to, to cross either way, you were supposed to badge in or out. And I tried these handles, these big crash bar handles, and the door would not open. Well, that tells me instantly, if mechanically I'm pressing the, the handles, like there's no latches at that point, it's got to be magnets, right? So I'm looking around, I'm like, well, there's conduit, and this, there's like a little plate right here. Either there's a friggin' exit sign on the other side of that door, which no, there's not, because you need a badge to go through to these two zones, or that's the effing wires. And sure enough, like screwdriver, little wire nuts, I pulled them off, and the door just flew open. And like the person who's like, we never thought anyone would take the time to do that. I'm like, take the time. I pulled a chair, I have a screwdriver in my freaking pocket. Like this was the easiest thing in the world. It took me about 30 seconds. And the real funny thing is when we were showing this to the, the client, we were on site you know, the next few days and I was like, look, here's what I did. And I was like doing it and somebody else badged in the door and came through and they, they didn't freak out. I'm like a guy, I'm not even on a ladder, I'm on a chair. The person's like, oh, sorry, I didn't know someone was working in this wing. And they just like walked by me. So like, I'm like, I don't care. You think someone wouldn't stand on a chair and do this? Like, I, nobody thinks it's weird. Like, you're not going to, oh, no one would be exposed like that. You look like a freaking work. But you put two people wearing roughly the same clothes. No one questions anything they're doing in the building. So keep all of this in mind. Threats come from a lot of angles, right? 
electronic system, we do a lot of stuff, like we can do a whole, if you like this, maybe Bobak will come back next year, we'll do a whole electronic talk. So Bobak is our, mainly our electronics guy, cloning credentials, okay. like we love this kind of thing too. Uh, this was one of his earlier Proxmarks that he built and he hand wound this antenna. He's, he loves badge, badge stuff, so anything you want to talk about, access control badges, RFID, that's him all day. He actually, I'm very proud of him, I throw this slide in. He took a, uh, a giant R90, like these are like the big readers that you see in parking garages and such, because they have a, a long range reader, there's a big antenna coil. So he gutted one and put his own circuitry in it, his own self-contained power pack, his batteries, little display, Bluetooth radio, and he packages it all up, and it's a self-contained, we call it the hunt pad. So you can just walk around a building with this, run, no wires hanging out of it, no battery packs, just walking around, and he's picking up badges. Uh, it was featured in Mr. Robot, if you saw that episode at the coffee shop, so we're very proud of him. To conclude, and I know you're, you're giving me the flag, remember, 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 super easy stuff, right? So the padlock, shimming the latches, use a double ball mechanism, use something shim-proof, you should not be shimmed. Those warded keys, skeleton key attacks, please don't use warded locks for anything, that's a simple solution there. Overlifting, the lock should be fabricated to the correct dimension so that overlifting with a comb should not be possible. And reaching that release cam, there's that there should always be a blocking element. You shouldn't be able just to reach through the lock and hit the tail side, right? These are simple things that most good padlocks will do. Doors are a little more complicated, but they're not super hard, right? Let's do it and talk about it. The hinges, right? Security pins, jam pins, security hinges, easy to freaking install, costs you very little. If I slip that latch, like, again, it's door fitment, it's proper plates, have the anti-thrust mechanism working. It's easy to test for, it's easy to fix. Reaching through to the inside, the thumb turn, the crash bar, I can't do that if there is something blocking the gap. If there is a plate, if there's something running the whole door, if there's a contour door frame that I can't get through. Key boxes, please don't use them. Or if you really are told you have to, like, have legal talk to somebody, maybe you can get a variance and not have a key box. If you're working in IT, you probably have a low occupancy structure. In the US, that's the laws we go for, for like, yeah, I know we're supposed to do that by code, but like, no one's in this building. Uh, the edge gap where I was blowing the can of air and you know, spitting whiskey and stuff, like, again, just block that off. The bottom gap, they have dynamic door bottoms, they're a little harder to block off. Or you can use those shrouds and those clips on the inside handle so that I can't reach under and just grab the handle. And that door frame spreading, I realize it's, it's an obscure thing, but it's possible to prevent. Now, this is a, like a big list, but it's not that big. And it costs real money, but it's not like unconceivable money. If you have literally everything wrong with your most critical door, you're talking five, 600 euro. And that's great, I think. Be able to, to like, this is actionable stuff. You can find that money in the budget. The real reward, though, is when you tell someone like, oh yeah, I slipped this last, and I'm showing this one power company exact. I'm like, look, this, is, this door has just drifted down. And she's like, how do I fix that? I'm like, you could just file it, like just file it down a quarter inch. This was a photo in a locksmith magazine of using a scrap piece of metal with rivets to fix that latch that was like not engaging. So the cheapest fixes are usually the best. Many of you are innovative. Many of you have someone on staff who's got the tool bag. And for very little money or zero money, you can address almost everything I just showed you. And thank you for giving me the extra minute or two. Thank you for listening and just, you know, stay safe out there.